All right, guys, let's kick this off. Hi, my name is Christopher. I am from Smarter E-Commerce. I am together with Martin, your host of today, of today's webinar, which is about query sculpting. And we will walk you through the basic concepts of query sculpting. We will discuss with you uh, the challenges you will face uh, during the setup of a query split, of a query sculpting approach. We will talk with you about uh, segmenting options uh, which are available, which you can realize, and so on. And uh, yeah, later on we will be available for questions. During the session, you have the possibility to submit questions already. And you can do that by using the chat function within the webinar tool or via the Q&A section, which you should find on the bottom of the application. Um, one short second, uh, we have a problem with the unmute function of Martin. Please give me a second so I can tackle this. So Martin, you should be with us now as well. Okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> no worries, I will continue with, the, with sharing the deck. And yeah, I would like to start with a short introduction of myself. Uh, and before I do that, I quickly wanna point out that we will record this. So in case you have to leave earlier, or if you have any troubles with the internet connection, don't worry, uh, we are recording this and we will send it out afterwards. As I said, my name is Christopher. I am together with Martin today, your host, and we will let you through the topic. I'm working at Smarter E-Commerce. Uh, I joined Smarter E-Commerce in 2015, and I'm currently employed as product owner for our Google Shopping Management solution called Whoop. And yeah, as well as Martin, I'm quite interested in the topic uh, search engine advertising with a heavy focus on Google Shopping. And since we made some Good progress with our product, which we will touch base quickly within this session as well. We thought, why not um, sit together and do a webinar about an approach, which is, I would say, rather unique and how you can tweak a little bit the Google Ads system. As I said, our second speaker today will be Martin. Martin is working as a head of SEA at Blue Fusion, and he's basically the father of this uh, query split approach. He already pitched uh, or, or presented this set kind of setup a couple of years ago. And he's actually the kind of guy who is in un into unconventional Google Ads strategies. So whenever you will hear him talk, he has to share some valuable ways how you can tweak the system, how you can automate the system, and how you can get more out of your Google Ads performance, not only Google Shopping uh, related, but also in general, Google Ads. And with these words, I want to hand over to Martin, who will do uh, the first part of the section. All right, so, um, all right, let me quickly, uh, how do I capture your screen again? <laughs> um, ah, okay. So, uh, there we are. So, uh, Sorry, thank you for the very warm welcome. Um, so I'm going to do the basic concept. I'm going to explain how query segmentation works. Um, it's kind of the same concept that I introduced first in 2014. It's five years ago. Um, I will tell you how it works and a few things that we learned along the way that you have to, to look out for and how the basic model works. So it all starts with a problem. And the problem is that if you advertise on Google Shopping, you usually, well, you have a campaign, you have products, you advertise products. And you can, al can only advertise products and Google will do the rest. So for a nice running shoe like that, Google will show the products um, for, for queries that they deem relevant. So for example, this bunch of queries, very different queries, um, Google will just show the, this product. And since you're only advertising products, you can only bid on products. So in this example, you might bid 40 cents for a product. 
but that would mean that you would also bid 40 cents for each of those queries, which is not ideal because usually uh, you wouldn't do this in a keyword campaign. You would want to have different keywords and you would want to bid differently on them, but with shopping, normally you can't. Well, you can't unless you segment your queries. And to do that, you will need to have more than one campaign. You will have more than one campaign that uh, advertise the same products. And if you do that, um, you need to use priorities. With priorities, um, you can say this is a high priority campaign and this is a medium priority campaign. What then happens is that competing, uh, when, whenever these campaigns compete against each other, the higher priority campaign takes precedence. So in this example, all of these queries will go to the first campaign and none will go to the second campaign. Now, what we want to do is we want to send some of those queries to campaign number two. And we do that by just blocking them from campaign number one to using a negative keyword. In this case, let's say we want to send all queries that contain the word cheap to the second campaign. And we just use cheap as a negative keyword there, meaning all of these keywords will be blocked. All of these queries will be blocked in campaign number one. So the competition is no longer there and they all go to campaign number two. And now we can, can bid differently on these keyword clusters, these query clusters. So we might bid 40 cents on the first campaign, on the first campaign's product, meaning 40 cents on all, all of those queries, but only 20 cents on all queries that contain the word cheap, because we may think these are queries that are less valuable. We can also do this with three tiers, with three shopping campaigns. So again, simple example, let's say we want to make three, cl three clusters, one only for keywords that contain the word buy, one only for keywords that contain the word cheap, and one for the rest. Then again, we will use negative keywords to block all keywords and uh, all queries that contain the words cheap or buy from the first campaign. And we also block all keywords containing the word buy from the second campaign. So only the keywords that contain the word cheap go to campaign number two. And again, the keywords containing the word buy will end up in campaign number three. That is how the basic concept works, how you can make sure that you send some queries to a different campaign. And you can do a lot with this, but there are a few things that you should know. There are some things that you don't have to worry about and some things where you, where you have to make sure they are all right for this to work. Let's start with the good things, with the freedoms. A great thing is that you don't need any bidding hierarchy. So for example, you can have one campaign with high bids, uh, the medium campaign with uh, medium bids and a low priority campaign with low bids. You can do it like that but you could also have it the other way around. So the highest bids and the lowest priority campaign, or you can mix it up. In general, all in all, you don't have to, to look at the order. You can do whatever you want inside these campaigns. You don't have to look at other campaigns. You're completely free to do your bidding however you like. And you're also free in terms of internal structure. So for example, you might have two campaigns and they have the same internal structure. In this case, they are separated or, or, or organized by, by brands. You can do it like that, but you could also have different internal organizations. So one campaign may be, um, may be organized by product type and another one may be organized by custom label or however you want. There's no reason to to tie these things together, you are completely free to do inside these campaigns whatever you want. As long as the targeting matches. Matching targeting means this. Um, look at this example. We have two campaigns and they are targeting both computers and mobile phones. And that's okay. What's not okay would be if we would have our campaign number one 
just targeting computers. And campaign number two, targeting computers and smartphones. Because on smartphones, there's no competition between those campaigns. If someone searches anything on their smartphone, only campaign number two is there to pick up the query. That means that all of these mobile queries would go directly to campaign number two and there would be no, no uh, segmentation here. And the same is true for any other targeting type. So in terms of when you advertise, if campaign number two is on weekends and campaign number two isn't, then you have a problem. Same goes for location, audiences, and especially products. So you can't just advertise some products in this campaign and other products in the other campaign. That is the same problem. The targeting has to be the same. And another thing that's actually not very logical, but is, it is like that, is you have to make sure your budget is enough. Your budget is not limited. Because if the first campaign is somehow limited by budget, then again, the queries will go to campaign number two. And I used to, to recommend using a shared budget to combat this, but actually a shared budget doesn't help. Logically, it should help, but it doesn't. So the thing is you have to make sure that your campaigns or especially your higher priority campaigns, that they are not limited by budget because otherwise the system just breaks down. All right, so, um, now let's look at the basic model. Um, this is the thing that I introduced in 2014, and that is still, uh, I think, the go-to model today. And the go-to model is built on this idea that people refine their searches, or maybe they don't refine them, but different people um, have different, well, use different kinds of queries. There are generic queries, there are queries containing a brand, like Essex Running Shoes, and there are product specific queries where someone is looking for this one specific product. And in Google Shopping, they will all get to see the same ad. They all get to see the same ad, but we shouldn't use the same bits there. That is the idea. And we, we do, did a case study with one client and their average revenue per click was four euros and eight cents. So on average, anyone who clicked their shopping ads would buy for four euros. But it turns out if we differentiate, if we segment these queries and just look at the revenue um, for different kinds of queries, it turns out that product specific queries where someone is looking for just one specific product and they are really, that they are more ready to buy. So with these people, with these queries, we make almost twice as much money per click. So we would probably bid twice as high on that. And it's similar with brand related queries. Again, we are high above the average. average. And of course, um, the rest has to be below the, the average. And in this case, with, the, with this client, um, we have a five to one ratio between, between product specific queries and the rest. So if someone's looking for a specific product, that click is five times as valuable as someone looking for, I don't know, something generic, um, people who are still looking. And this is a picture that we see with all of our clients. It's not always these steps. It's not always, I don't know, five to one. Uh, in some cases, it's two to one. In some cases, it may be 10 to one. So this is different. But it's always the same, that product-specific queries are much more valuable, brand-related queries are also more valuable, and then the rest is much less valuable. So the steps are different, but the overall picture is the same. And this is why the basic structure for, camp for our campaigns hasn't really changed over the years. We would have three campaigns, if we can, um, one for product-related terms, one for brand related terms and one for, for the rest. The, um, the latest, the last one is sometimes referred to as the generic campaign for generic queries, 
which is somewhat true, but it's really just the rest. It's the, it's the stuff we don't cover anywhere else that goes there. Well, then we have priorities. We have high priority for the rest campaign. We have medium priority for the brand terms and low priority for the product related terms. And this sometimes confuses people. Uh, if they see this, why has the product related campaign, why, why do they have the lowest priority? But it has to be for this concept to work um, so that we can block some queries from some places. Uh, we once had a client who uh, saw that these uh, the product related terms um, that they were, they were doing so well and uh, right before the weekend they made it a high priority campaign and uh, well that didn't work out so well. Well we would have of course negative keywords in our model we would have brand related terms uh, just in the rest campaign so we push all brand terms down to the brands campaign and we would have product related terms in both the rest campaign and the brands campaign. So these product terms, they would all go to the products campaign. And finally, we have bits. Um, we can use low bits um, in our REST campaign and then go higher and higher. Um, this is something that you will eventually do when you see the performance, but you don't have to start that way. Actually, you can just bit however you want. You can use the same bits everywhere and then the, just look at your performance because the performance from your product terms will be much better than from the generic terms. So you will automatically adjust your bits. So this is the structure that we recommend to everyone who is doing shopping. Um, Christopher will in a minute uh, show you some advanced things you can do with this or based on this. Um, one more thing from me is, um, while we recommend this to everyone, it's not really applicable to everyone because these product related terms, they work well in some industries like electronics where someone is looking for part numbers or for model names that are very specific, but it wouldn't, for example, work in fashion because no one knows uh, the exact uh, name for that nice green dress. So if you can, I think you should always use the three-tiered structure, but most people would probably just um, separate between brand and everything else. All right, that were the basics. These were the basics. Um, so I give over to Christopher now. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that was a really good introduction into the topic, and I hope everyone got a glimpse on what is possible, what challenges you will face there, and so on. What I wanna talk about is segmenting campaigns. Um, and also, I wanna have a closer look at the challenges you face with this approach. Something Martin mentioned at the beginning was, this is, is that the approach is already uh, quite old, meaning uh, he first presented this in 2014, and we're still talking about this, and some of you might ask, why is this then even relevant, although it's that old? And I can tell you, especially nowadays, where we are heading into a situation where you give up control, uh, let's say, for example, by using smart shopping campaigns, I think this kind of setups are even more crucial in order to stay in control, in order to have transparency, and in order to leverage all the data points which are available. And as Martin explained, basically what um, or how the setup looks like is you make use of um, several campaigns which are equal. Uh, you make use of campaign priorities of different bids and negative keywords in order to funnel queries accordingly. And as Martin mentioned as well, you do this based on some kind of bias intention. And before we talk a little bit about this uh, in more detail, I wanna ask you, uh, I wanna ask the audience who already has um, touch based with this approach, maybe tried it on their own, maybe um, uh, switch back again because it didn't work out. Feel free to share some uh, insights within the chat. Maybe we can talk about this later on during the Q&A session. Yeah, and the segmenting, as Martin already said, is um, something 
which is basically tied to the performance of your queries. And the most common approach is um, basically this brand generic and product specific query pattern, whereby it's based on the conversion likelihood per query bucket. So what we basically expect or assume is that for queries which are more generic, uh, you will be triggered within quite um, uh, within the higher section of the sales funnel, which is somewhere uh, attention seeking, somewhere interest showing users, uh, some users which are just comparing your products. And the more product specific the queries get, the higher the conversion likelihood is because the, the user is already knowing what he's searching for and knows what he wants to buy. This is quite cool and a good start into the topic, but there are different ways how you can segment as well, because there are retailers of different um, industries and so on. So maybe another use case makes more sense than just a plain product versus brand versus generic approach. And as Martin said already, there are two ways how you can uh, segment queries into different uh, campaign buckets. Uh, and one way is a we call this a three-way query split and another way is a two-way query split uh, whereby it depends on your needs and also on your cap capacity and capabilities uh, whatever you want to prefer uh, to realize. We will see later on some challenges you will face and maybe with these challenges in mind it makes more sense to go for a two-way query split rather than a three-way query split and just do a split by brand and rest. Furthermore, if you think about the setup itself where you use uh, campaigns several times uh, or the same campaign setup several times, it simplifies some things if you use, for example, a two-way query split and combine this, for example, with a device campaign split. Or if you think about bidding, uh, in case of bidding, the more data you have, the better it is. If you do a two-way query split, you have uh, the data basically divided into two, two buckets only. If you do a three-way query split, it's three buckets and you somehow have to deal with the scarcity of data, just to keep that in mind. One way how you can figure out which segmenting option works for you is um, working with some tools or scripts uh, we offer, therefore, a free-to-use free data visualization tool called Orbiter, um, whereby you can make use of a so-called search term sunburst chart, which visualize, visualizes uh, in some kind of glazed donut uh, the performance per device and per query pattern. And this looks basically like this. You have in the inner ring the devices and on the outer ring uh, queries, and they are they are uh, segmented by impressions, clicks, costs, or conversion value, whatever you want to choose. And uh, if you click uh, on one of the tiles, you can go a little bit deeper in there, check different queries, how they perform, and uh, you can also get an overview of different query packets performing within your Google Ads account. Another way, and a way where you don't have to use any external tool, would be just going through your search term report. So this is actually the source later on for your negative keywords most likely. And it can be also used for doing some analysis in order to retrieve which queries um, deliver the best conversion rates or the highest uh, conversion value per click. And uh, I can just recommend you to go through it. Maybe you will also derive some other information to empower also other Google Ads formats. And um, yeah, use segmenting options and filtering options in order to get to the bottom line of your search term report and in order to figure out which queries are performing well for your business, which are not performing that well, and to do a segmenting based on that. And what I can recommend you is just keep in mind what your products have uh, as an attribute value and think about how you would search for your products. And one example within the electronics industry, uh, which Martin was also mentioning is 
that, for example, product specific queries might make not that much sense because people tend maybe to search for more technical descriptions or for uh, part numbers instead of, let's say, a color or a size. And with this thing in mind, you can also work with the search term report in order to get to the bottom line and to figure out which, item, uh, which queries are performing in, in what way and where you have higher conversion rates versus where you have lower conversion rates. This is one way how you can deal with it. Another way is uh, just working with, uh, let's say, industry examples, which I brought with me today. So uh, we implemented some queries cutting approaches in the past already and still doing it. And we gathered some insights how our client base is doing this. And I want to share three industry examples with you, from, one from the electronic industry, one from the fashion industry, and one of a generalist. And usually the upper funnel, which is basically the rest part, is uh, quite common with all segments. Um, those are the low performing queries. And mid funnel and lower funnel, which are the uh, higher performing queries, are quite different. So for example, if you think about the electronic industry, we already talked about it. There is maybe not a high likelihood that people are searching for brands or uh, product related terms. But I've, uh, what we discovered is there's a higher likelihood that categories are searched um, and or numeric or alphanumeric combinations. And this can be used in order to define and segment um, queries and uh, your setup. In the fashion industry, it's a little bit different. Um, there's a, a high, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, uh, there's the, the product, uh, itself in, more in the focus, that means the color, the size, maybe the material, even the gender is uh, quite catching. And this is something you can also reflect in there. What is also interesting, especially for brands which only have one brand, let's say Nike, Adidas or Puma, they might want to use within the mid-funnel section sub-brands or designer in order to uh, build this query bucket. And on the generalist side, it's actually quite tricky, whereby we also recommend uh, to use in the mid funnel segment brand terms. And on the lower funnel, it can be a combination out of alphanumeric, numeric uh, terms of product lines, which is basically a product specific query. Or what you can also consider is a rule based uh, negative keyword list approach, where you basically say uh, or filter search terms based on a condition and then add those queries as negative keywords to your negative keyword list. Another way, which is, I would say, quite an advanced way, and which is tackling one problem within this uh, approach is that you don't stick to heter heterogeneous patterns and you don't have to research patterns by using term scoring. With term scoring, you cannot basically predict how and, and funnel queries upfront. It will always be done on past activity. So how, what the name already intends is that you go through your search term report, you check how your queries are performing, and try to identify good performing queries um, next to the standard patterns. That means what you make use of is different KPIs in order to determine if a query is performing well according to your business needs or not that well. And you assign a score to each of those queries and then add those queries as a negative, negative keyword to the according campaign and therefore final queries accordingly. And as the name says, term scoring is about building a score based on specific patterns within this term. And the cool thing here is you can define how this pattern should look like and how you get to this score in the end. So you can have a look at different aspects of the query, such as the KPI uh, of this query in terms of ROAS, if there is a buying intention in the term, how many words are used in the term, are there any alphanumeric combinations, and so on and so forth, whatever fits your needs. 
and then you define a rule how you want to determine and calculate the score and we brought with us a simplified example let's say you have um, Nike shoes as a search term it would basically be two words so the word count would be two you would have a brand reference in there, in there which means also two there is no buying intention in terms of a keyword such as buy uh, in there so it's zero and there's also no number included so the resulting score would be four let's imagine another query nike running shoes by 8.5 here the word count is higher here we have five words there's a brand reference in there a buying intention and a number included and let's say those are all um, uh, uh, important for your business important uh, parts of the term and therefore the query gets a higher score and as i said previously you can also bring in uh, kpis which are relevant to your business that means you can also add let's say rowers performance conversion rate uh, whatever uh, to this uh, scoring model keep in mind as i said this is based on past data so you cannot predict of course what people will search in the future so you constantly have to do this and update uh, your queries your negative keyword lists and uh, fuel basically this approach so it's quite an advanced approach but maybe also a way how you can do the segmenting within your setup this brings me to the next topic uh, which challenges will you face so as you maybe already figured out with martin's talk there are already some let's say pitfalls and challenges you will face during the setup and i want to have a little bit of a closer look uh, in this uh, area uh, of, of uh, in this field of area and it starts with the setup basically where you already have uh, or where you already face some some challenges it continues throughout the creation of the negative negative keywords and it starts already as uh, we just have seen with the segmentation and we will also talk about maintenance and optimization so that means just by creating this structure this will not be enough you also have to maintain it you have to apply different goals different bits and so on uh, and we will also discuss this a little bit let's start with the setup as we already have heard if you want to go for such an approach you will need um, a, a, a multiply way of making use of the campaigns that means you have to use the current campaign set and let's say in this example it's split by category and you want to use the same uh, setup as well within all of your segment uh, of your segments then you have to create three times uh, this campaign setup that means you need three times the campaign clothing three times the campaign shoes and so on for every uh, stage of the funnel and that means not only that you have to create equal campaigns in terms of products in there no you also have to create it as martin said equal to the settings so if you miss out to set for example uh, the specific device modifier or execute a specific device uh, this setup might break and you will funnel queries to the wrong campaign that means uh, ads might be shown with a very high bid which results in additional costs and most likely in not the return you expect and let's have a closer look at one of those examples where you might risk where you might uh, get in the case that uh, this setup breaks let's assume you're just about to set up everything and uh, you already set have been setting up the bits and the settings on campaign level you already created a bunch of campaigns and you are just about structuring the ad groups and product groups and let's assume you forget one of the ad groups aka one of the brands and you only add brand c to the lower funnel uh, campaign and your clients uh, your uh, and users start to search for specific products of your assortment and let's assume the quite generic search term will still be funneled to the correct campaign because it doesn't show anything which is uh, brand or product related but as soon as someone is searching for a brand related term such as brand c 
the structure will already break and your ad will be triggered via the lower funnel campaign with a high or very high bid. And this is something you should take care of. And this is something we will also touch again once we are talking about maintaining because just think about that you regularly update your assortment, you might get into a situation quarterly or even more often uh, where you have to do updates and you might risk or forget something. And then the, break, uh, the setup will break. Another pitfall, which is maybe not that common, um, but might be something uh, for one or the other retailer who is working with uh, bigger catalogs and more target countries, uh, targeting uh, Google Ads account limits. And there are several limits you have to consider. It starts with targeting limits. Uh, then we have negative keyword list limits or, or negative keyword limits. And another restriction, which is related to the everything else partition, which is not necessarily tied to a query split approach, but also it is um, necessary to mention it there. And yeah, with the targeting limits, uh, you should be careful because Google Ads allows only 5 million targeting limits or targeting criterions within one Google Ads account, which includes product groups, keywords, etc. And this m might be not a problem on first sight, but let's assume you have several target countries you are operating in, you have a huge catalog, and you start creating this approach within several target countries. And then you might easily get into a situation where you um, exceed the limit of the Google Ads account. And uh, yeah, then you have to think of how you want to deal with it. Another um, example or another case is the limit regarding keywords and negative, uh, and negative keyword lists. Uh, also there you have a limited set available. That means in some via keyword lists, you can only add 10,000 negative keywords. So if you have a really huge catalog or um, again, several target countries you want to manage with, think about it up, up, uh, up front because otherwise you have to figure out how you deal with it afterwards once you may be already in the situation that you create such setups and then it will be even more trickier to tackle this. And one thing I want to raise awareness is um, that Google states in the Google Ads support lines that you should not work with more than 100 excluded everything else partitions. Otherwise, this might result in a potential bid conflict. Uh, this is something, although we work with a lot of retailers with big catalogs and with huge campaign setups, something we only discovered uh, throughout the years three times, but it results in the case that your ads will not be shown and that you have to rebuild previous structures in order to not uh, get into such a situation uh, where you have, uh, where you end up with a lot of everything else partitions. For everyone who doesn't know everything else partitions, they will be basically created within every ad group you create within a Google Shopping campaign. Um, so it's at least one everything else partition is within one ad group. Yeah, and one thing which also adds up on that pile is if you think about a bigger structure, that means if you do not only have a query split in place and uh, also have a device and query split combination in place, which basically uh, is another duplication of the campaign set where you wrap around uh, negative modifiers per device in order to uh, target specific queries on specific devices. Uh, it will result in nine times uh, the setup workload because you basically have to create nine times the initial campaign you have before a query and device split combination. So keep in mind that uh, the bigger the setup will be, the bigger the workload will be. And also, as I already said, you will also get into other challenges within creating negative keywords, managing negative keywords, and within maintenance and optimization. As we already discussed, there are different ways how you can segment uh, your queries or your search terms and how you can uh, funnel queries to different campaigns. And one way how you can get 
to such a funneling is making use of the search term report and process the search term report on a regular basis. That means you go through it, identify in first place what works well for you, what are, um, where is the conversion likelihood, and how do you want to structure your query split. And later on, it's just enriching the existing basis. And uh, you should think about how often do you have to do this, depending on also catalog changes, on changes of the user behavior, are there any terms which actually should drop out at some point in order uh, that the funneling uh, works accordingly again, and so on. And I would recommend you to not underestimate this topic. Uh, we did a short analysis, and for example, for our bigger merchants, we're talking here about 13,000 unique terms which are coming along on a daily basis. So this is, can be quite a workload which is uh, coming towards you. If you think it's too much work to process uh, the search term report, you can also make uh, use of other sources. Uh, for example, of the product data feed, where you just take specific terms out of it, such as the brand or product related terms or gender or color, and add those as a negative term to a negative keyword list. And there's another topic which we already slightly touched. It's about maintenance and optimization, where you also easily get into situations where you think like, okay, how should I manage this now? How should I proceed with this topic? And who should do this on also a regular basis? So as good as the setup sounds, and as much as control you get, you also always have to keep in mind what kind of workload comes towards you and your team. So not only you have to consider how you deal with, let's say, catalog updates that you bring live to products within your Google campaigns, you also have to think of how do you manage the bidding. As we said already earlier, the more granular the setup is, the less data you get for a specific query bucket, most likely. So you should also consider and think about how you manage the bidding accordingly and how you can reflect your goals still within this structure. And yeah, tied to the update of catalog and product assortment is also the update of negative keyword lists. So how often do you wanna do this? Do you have to remove negative keyword list, also regular uh, negative keywords within the negative keyword list regularly? And um, yeah, just keep in mind again, at some point you are maybe exceeding or reaching the Google Ads limit regarding uh, targeting criterions and negative keyword lists. So maybe it's even necessary to remove negative terms from the negative keyword list. However, there are a lot of tools and providers tackling this topic and some are doing this script-based, some are doing this quite agnostic and I just wanna, before we end uh, this webinar and, and come to the Q&A, drop or, or share some words about our, uh, our approach, how we manage things. Um, and whoever is using Whoop, our Google Shopping Management tool, most likely knows how we are dealing with things and uh, maybe also is already using this approach. What we can do is we um, basically automated this whole process in terms of creating campaigns, creating um, the negative keyword lists, ensuring uh, the correct priority within every campaign, ensuring the right device modifier and stuff like this. So what we are capable of is that we automatically generate and update up to nine campaigns and give you time in order to reflect uh, um, the performance and bring in uh, your own goals and, and um, take care of the necessary parts of the management of your Google Shopping campaigns. And in addition, besides providing this automation, we also provide maximum transparency within our tool. And uh, I think the most crucial part is actually the flexibility in terms of defining the query funnel. That means um, what we talked earlier is that um, within our tool, we would take care of, of the challenges basically, but together with you, we would be capable of defining the query funnel according to your needs. 
And whether it is a two-way query split or a three-way query split, we will have the possibility to define with you how you want to make it look like and how you want to funnel queries within um, your setup. And with these words, uh, I want to take a look at the Q&A section. I want to say thank you to everyone who joined. And Martin and myself, we will take now our time to go through, through the Q&A section. And yeah, if you have any questions regarding uh, what we presented, feel free to add them via the Q&A button uh, in, in the middle of your, uh, of your screen or via the chat function. Yeah, let me take over because we have two questions for you. Uh, so let me just ask them. Your example of term scoring, where would you extract data and import this back into Google Ads? Do you use BigQuery for this? Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, we didn't set up such an approach yet. So this is uh, pretty uh, theoretically spoken what we presented there. It depends on the use case actually. So if it's a big merchant uh, with a lot of, um, with, a, with a bigger assortment and a lot of queries coming along, most likely you will need to rely on BigQuery. Um, but I would say for testing and for getting started with this approach, you might can do this manually within uh, a spreadsheet uh, in order to identify specific terms and patterns within those queries and calculate uh, a score and tie the score manually to, to specific queries and funnel those queries into different campaigns. But if you want to do this on scale, I would definitely consider to do this via BigQuery, via a scripted approach, uh, something like this. Okay, and we have a second question from Carlos who says, about the everything else excluded partition limited by 100. That 100 is for the whole account? Uh, I think if it's yeah. a few, it doesn't make sense with this structure. Yeah, I mean, in general, that's a good one. <laughs> Thanks for asking that, Carlos. Um, Actually, this is something quite hidden within the Google uh, Shopping description. That means this, not, this does not only apply to this kind of setup, it applies to your entire shopping campaigns within a given account. And um, I can tell you, we are working with a lot of retailers with quite big setups where we easily exceed those 100 uh, everything else partitions, and it didn't lead to an issue. But Throughout the years, as I said, we discovered three cases where this actually was an issue. And it's nothing which is quite common on Google's side, actually. They are struggling with this topic as well uh, because it took us like five working days in order to get to the bottom line and identify the real cause of this. And then we just deleted ad groups and final things in one ad group in order to resolve this issue. But to answer your question, this actually applies to the entire account, yes. I think, Martin, there's one for you as well. Um, if we have to uncap the budget in order to avoid restricted by budget, how can we ensure that we remain within our overall budget? Um, right, well, basically you cannot um, really steer by budget. You cannot, um, cannot use the budget in, in, uh, in the sense that, well, there, there is a cap. Um, what you can still do is just look at your bids and, um, well, manage your bids in a way that you're within your budget. Um, for us, I think um, usually this is not that big a deal because usually, um, well, I th well, maybe just us, but I think um, most retailers, um, they have targets like ROAS or more, um, more sophisticated even. Um, where as long as you hit your goals, you can spend as much as you like. So budget, um, I think you should, usually, you should still use budget as a, um, a safety net. So don't just make your budget 100,000 euros per day or something like that, um, but have it um, well above what you usually spend so that you don't run into a limit there. Um, but that's what, I've, what I use budgets for, and that's that. Otherwise, we um, we use bits to well to 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 um, control the rest. 
thank you for answering this. There's another quite interesting one. I came along through the chat function and it was Johannes who was asking, where would we um, place smart shopping campaigns within the structure? Or I think uh, also in general related to, to standard shopping campaigns. Do you want to tackle this as well, Martin? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, smart shopping, um, I'm not a fan <laughs> because smart shopping is, is really, really a black box. With smart shopping, you can't even learn from it. You have to, to rely on it, doing what it's supposed to do, uh, which it sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. But you can't even look at it and, and see the search terms. So, for example, when, uh, when a new client comes to, I don't know, an agency like us, you could always look into their queries and learn something from that. If you use smart shopping, you have this black box and you cannot look at the queries, which I think is, well, not a scandal, but it's not, not looking good. And especially there are other settings about, um, or other segments that you can't see with mm. smart shoppings, yeah. like um, which network your, your ads were shown at, which I think is a very basic thing. But Google invented a new category, uh, which is cross-network, so that they don't have to tell you where your, where your ads are showing. And I've heard this a couple of times that people talk to Google and Google is always like, wow, really, you need this? I, we, have, we had no idea. And yeah, right. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a fan of smart shopping. With this approach, it's not compatible because you don't have any control. You can't learn anything from it. So yeah, that's smart shopping. Yeah, I can just agree with you, Martin. Um, unfortunately, as you already said, uh, the format itself is maybe quite powerful because it combines not only standard shopping campaigns, but also uh, dynamic remarketing, dynamic prospecting and so on. But you sacrifice, therefore, control and transparency, which is quite crucial um, because if you think about you want to get more control again, you want to also get some insights maybe for other marketing channels, how your assortment is performing throughout uh, your client base and so on, you will limit yourself at some point. And you can, for example, not derive any information which you can then use to enter other countries um, as well, for example. Yeah, guys, thank you for joining. Um, we basically exceeded already the time box for the webinar. Uh, thanks for everyone who participated and streamed in. Thank you also for Mar to Martin who joined us today for his valuable insights and his point of view. Thanks for having me. And yeah, we wish you both a pleasant rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.